The 30th of January, 1933. Adolf Hitler is appointed Chancellor of Germany, bringing an end to German democracy. Guided by racist and authoritarian ideas, the Nazis abolish basic freedoms and seek to create a community which would unite all social classes and regions of Germany behind one Führer. However, not everyone belongs to this new Germany. Based on anti-homosexuality laws that precede the Nazi era, thousands of homosexual and transgender people will be arrested and thrown into concentration camps during Adolf Hitler's dictatorship. For their sexual orientation and gender identities, many of them will have to endure immense suffering and pay the ultimate price. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the nature of human sexuality became an important area of scientific investigation and debate. Germany was at the forefront of this development, not least because of debates regarding paragraph 175, which from 1871 banned sexual relations between men. Even though there were groups who supported the decriminalization of sexual relations between men, such as the large moderate left Social Democratic Party or the more radical Communist Party, there were also groups who advocated for making this statute stricter. Among them were mainstream religious organizations, as well as various moderate and right-wing political parties, such as the radically right-wing Nazi Party, which officially opposed any efforts to decriminalize sexual relations between men. Wilhelm Frick, a Nazi member of the Reichstag, the Parliament of Nazi Germany, stated in 1927 that men committing unnatural sexual acts with men must be persecuted with the utmost severity, because such vices will lead to the disintegration of the German people. Adolf Hitler was appointed Chancellor of Germany in January 1933. In the first two and a half years of the Nazi regime, the government enforced Paragraph 175, similarly to the way it was enforced in the Weimar Republic. At this time, the Nazis also used other means to target Germany's gay community. For example, they closed meeting places, arrested repeat offenders, and shuttered presses. However, after, in 1935, the Nazi regime revised Paragraph 175, and it began prosecuting men in far greater numbers for violating this statute. The revision broadly expanded the type of act subject to punishment and dramatically increased the number of men punished under the statute. The new version of Paragraph 175 had two additional sections, 175A and 175B. Section 175A listed four specific behaviors that the Nazis saw as particularly egregious violations of Paragraph 175. These included a man coercing another man to have sex, a man initiating sexual relations with a male subordinate or employee, a man having sexual relations with a male minor under the age of 21, and a man engaging in prostitution with another man. The Nazi regime saw men who engaged in these behaviors as particularly harmful because they believed that these men were corrupting other men. According to 175A, these acts could result in a sentence of up to 10 years hard labor in prison. Within the context of the German criminal justice system, this was a comparatively long and harsh prison sentence. Among the homosexual men arrested under the Nazi revised paragraph 175 belonged Harry Pauli, a German theater actor from Berlin who spent most of his time with other actors, both at the theater and in nightclubs where gay men gathered. When the Nazis came to power, some gay men, especially those who were Jewish, were killed by Nazi sympathizers. Harry's friend Susie, a drag queen, was stabbed to death. In 1936, Harry was arrested and imprisoned in a camp at Neusserstrom, where he was first placed in solitary confinement and later had to do the heaviest work in the marshes for 12 hours a day. After 15 months, he was released. In 1943, however, after Harry was turned in by two boys, pressured by the Gestapo to denounce gay men, he was once again sentenced under paragraph 175. This time, he was released after only eight months because his friends in the theater intervened on his behalf. Harry was then drafted into the army, but wherever he went, people knew of his 175 conviction and called him homophobic slurs. Harry could not stand it and deserted twice. Finally, as punishment, he was sent to a special combat unit in which almost everyone was killed, yet he was the only one to miraculously survive. When reforming the statute in 1935, Nazi jurists had a chance to extend paragraph 175 to women. However, they chose not to do so because the Nazi leaders saw lesbians as women who had a responsibility to give birth to racially pure Germans called Aryans. 
The Nazis concluded that Aryan lesbians could easily be persuaded or forced to bear children. Their beliefs drew on widespread attitudes about the differences between male and female sexuality. Furthermore, women did not typically hold leadership roles in the military, economy, or national politics. Therefore, the Nazis did not view lesbians or sexual relations between women as a direct threat to the German state. However, women who identified as lesbians were sometimes charged under other statutes, such as the ban on sexual relations with her minor. By the end of 1936, SS leader and chief of the German police, Heinrich Himmler, had taken the lead in cracking down on homosexuality, which he called a public scourge. He directed the police forces under his control to enforce paragraph 175. Himmler believed that this was necessary for the protection and strengthening of the German people. In 1936, Himmler established the Reich Central Office for combating homosexuality and abortion. This office was part of the Kripo, criminal police, and worked closely with the Gestapo, political police, and one of its main responsibilities was to police and track down men suspected of homosexuality. Under Himmler's direction, these police forces diligently pursued violations of paragraph 175. The Nazis conducted targeted raids on locales popular with gay men and closely monitored Germany's gay communities. Scholars estimate that there were approximately 100,000 arrests for violations of paragraph 175 during the Nazi regime, and over half of these arrests, approximately 53,400, resulted in convictions. However, because some men were arrested, convicted, and thus counted in these statistics more than once, these numbers do not tell us the total number of individual men arrested and convicted for violating paragraph 175. Statistics from the 1930s show that Nazi policies had a significant impact on the number of men convicted under paragraph 175. While in 1934, there were 948 convictions for violating paragraph 175, in 1938, the number of convictions increased to approximately 8,500. Not everyone arrested under paragraph 175 identified as a man. During the German Empire and the Weimar Republic, Germany was home to a developing community of people who identified as transvestites. Magnus Hirschfeld, a German physician and sexologist, coined the term transvestite in 1910. Initially, this term encompassed people who performed in drag, people who cross-dressed for pleasure, as well as those who today might identify as trans or transgender. While today, in English, the term transvestite is outdated and offensive, it was widely used at the time. Some self-identified transvestites were arrested under paragraph 175. These were people who were assigned male sex at birth, but identified and often dressed and lived as women. When they engaged in sexual relations with men, the Nazi regime saw this as male-on-male -male sex. But many transvestites did not see themselves as homosexual, and did not consider their sexual relations with men as male-on-male -male sex. Nonetheless, they were punished according to the regime's definition. Most men arrested under paragraph 175 were given fixed prison sentences. There were, however, some men sent to concentration camps for indefinite terms. Scholars estimate that this group numbered between 5,000 and 15,000 men. The Gestapo and the Kripo both had the power to send men accused of homosexuality to concentration camps. These men were considered repeat offenders and had multiple convictions for violating paragraph 175. Nazi leaders, including Himmler, believed that these men were particularly dangerous because they believed that these homosexual men could and would seduce heterosexual men, which in their opinion would decrease the German birth rate and weaken the nation. The Nazis classified prisoners in concentration camps into groups according to the reason for their imprisonment. By 1938, these groups were identified with various colored badges worn on camp uniforms. Many men imprisoned for allegedly violating paragraph 175 had to wear a pink triangle. This badge identified them as homosexual according to the prisoner classification system. Sometimes, these prisoners were called 175ers. Pink triangle prisoners suffered enormous abuse in the concentration camps. They often found themselves near the bottom of the camp hierarchy, where they were subject to abuse from other prisoners and from the SS guards. Josef Kohut, an Austrian pink triangle prisoner, later testified, a homosexual was never permitted to have a position of responsibility. We couldn't even speak with other prisoners. We were told we might try to seduce them. We were forbidden to approach within five meters of other blocks, and anyone caught doing so was whipped on the horse and received at least 15 to 20 lashes. We were to remain the damnedest of the damned, the camp's shitty queers, 
condemned to liquidation. He continued, In the morning we had to cart snow from the left side of the road to the right side. In the afternoon, we had to cart the same snow back to the left. We didn't have barrows or shovels, but had to use our hands. Our bare hands. Twenty turns shoveling snow, then twenty carrying it away, and all at the double. Another man arrested by the Nazis for his homosexuality was Frenchman Pierre Seal. After being arrested in May 1941, he and other homosexual men were taken to a police station where they were beaten. Seal later recalled, At first we managed to endure the suffering, but ultimately it became impossible. The machinery of violence accelerated. Outraged by our resistance, the SS began pulling out the fingernails of some of the prisoners. Seal added that in their fury, the Germans raped the poor men with a piece of broken wood. The SS then took Pierre and his boyfriend Joe to a lesser-known concentration camp, Schirmeck, about 30 miles from Strasbourg. On the first day there, Seal witnessed a public execution. The victim was stripped naked and had a metal bucket placed on his head to amplify his screams before the SS sicked their ferocious German shepherds on him. The guard dogs first bit into his groin and thighs and then devoured him right in front of the other prisoners. The victim was Joe, Pierre Seal's 18-year-old boyfriend. Nonetheless, a few well-educated men imprisoned as homosexuals managed to secure jobs within the camp administration. Holding such a position helped many of these prisoners survive. In general, however, research suggests that homosexual prisoners had a very low chance of survival. The Nazis even attempted to treat homosexuality. This was the reason why a Danish doctor, Karl Verne, visited Buchenwald concentration camp at least six times between June and December 1944. To test his hormone cures for homosexuality, he operated on 17 male inmates. They were forced to undergo an operation that involved the insertion of an artificial gland. Two of these patients later died from infections caused by the horrible sanitary conditions in Buchenwald. When Verne addressed his final report to Heinrich Himmler on the 10th of February 1945, he described his hormone research and alleged results without even mentioning his experiments in Buchenwald, which suggested that his research was probably deemed, even by him, either a failure or at the very least not sufficiently credible to merit a mention. The criminalizations of sexual relations between men in Germany did not end with the defeat of Nazi Germany in 1945. After World War II, Germany was remade by the Allied powers, and it became two countries in 1949. These countries were on opposite sides of the Cold War. The Federal Republic of Germany, West Germany, had a liberal democratic constitution and was aligned with the United States. The German Democratic Republic, East Germany, was a communist state and aligned with the Soviet Union. East Germany stopped enforcing Paragraph 175 in 1957 and fully abolished it in 1968. West Germany continued to use the 1935 Nazi version of Paragraph 175. At first, West German authorities vigorously enforced the statute, and between 1949 and 1969, 100,000 men were arrested under Paragraph 175, and approximately 59,000 of them were ultimately convicted. Some of these men received prison sentences, which were, however, typically much shorter than during the Nazi era, and in some cases, lasted days or weeks. Other men did not serve time, but instead had to pay a fine. In 1969, West Germany finally de-emphasized enforcement of the statute. It was only in 1994 when Paragraph 175 was dropped from the German Criminal Code, after East and West Germany had reunited as the Federal Republic of Germany. There were many tears shed for all those who suffered for their sexual orientations and gender identities. Thanks for watching the World History Channel. Be sure to like and subscribe, and click the bell notification icon so you don't miss our next episodes. We thank you, and we'll see you next time on the channel.